these two young boys became the epitome of success. Roderick, a handsome army officer, Mark, a high-flying city financier, but they detested their parents. They hated them for the way they'd been brought up. The Newell brothers were destined to be part of one of Britain's most shocking double murder cases. Roderick Newell got rid of his parents, brother Mark helped bury them, and they both shared their birthright. Matricide, killing your mother. Patricide, killing your father. Parricide, killing your parents. That's unbelievable. With no bodies and no witnesses, the police had nothing to go on. We came to a dead end, and there was nothing else we could do. But Roderick's all-consuming guilt cost them their freedom, and they were finally trapped in a global police operation. The most natural confession to a double murder you're ever going to listen to. While Nicholas and Elizabeth Newell were living it up on Jersey, Roderick Newell was plotting to kill them both in a violent and sadistic beating. Four shared lives destined to tragically collide. This is the story of Roderick Newell's countdown to murder. Wealthy Elizabeth and Nicholas Newell raised two good-looking, successful children on the Channel Island of Jersey. They had money, holidays and stability, but what the boys really wanted was their parents' love. They'd had no normal upbringing as far as normal kids would expect. A growing resentment towards their mother and father escalated when in their 20s they thought their parents were plundering their life savings. There was a lot of resentment about uh, money being frittered away. The brothers' anger came to a head in 1987. Their parents' investment bank crashed. Nicholas and Elizabeth stood to lose everything. It meant Roderick and Mark would inherit nothing, and it was Roderick Newell's trigger for murder. Jersey, the largest of the Channel Islands. With its attractive tax laws and warm, sunny climate, it's home to some of the richest people in the UK. And it was here that the wealthy Newell family settled in 1967. Nicholas Newell came from old Scottish money. His family were in shipbuilding. Elizabeth Newell had also inherited money. Her parents were successful farmers. The sailing mad Newells discovered the island of Jersey by accident en route from Scotland to the Caribbean. He took a decision. They were going to have a year off, and they said that they were going to go on this fantastic trip to the West Indies, but they only ever made it to Jersey because on the way there, Mark became ill, and they fell in love with the island and decided that the boys would grow up here. Nicholas and Elizabeth and loved life. Elizabeth was a... A jolly, happy person who liked to enjoy herself. Um, that was obviously clear. Elizabeth's lifestyle might be described as a jolly hockey stick. She was an active member of the tennis club. She liked uh, drinks and led a very active social life. But the Newell family dynamic was anything but stable. I had the impression with the Newells that the couple were the integral unit and the children were a little bit apart. That mustn't be confused with uh, cruelty or complete neglect. I think they only ever had the best of intentions toward their children. That meant following their own childhood experience, sending their sons to boarding school in England. At the £30,000 a year Radley College near Oxford, neither of the boys excelled academically, but they were both good at sport and popular amongst their friends. Like many wealthy families, Nicholas and Elizabeth believed they were doing the right thing, but their sons hated boarding school. The boys' resentment only worsened when in the summer holidays they had to stay in the UK with Nicholas's brother, Stephen, or Elizabeth's sister, Nancy Clark, known as Nan. When boarding school finished, when the summer terms were there, they went to Nan Clark's. They never saw the parents. With the boys either at boarding school or at their relatives, 
Nicholas and Elizabeth enjoyed middle age together, either at their hilltop house on Jersey, on their ocean-going yacht, or at their holiday home in southern Spain. It's a rather attractive life, wintering in Spain. In fact, the very week that uh, they disappeared, they were preparing for their annual trip to Spain. By the early 80s, Roderick and Mark were in their teens. Their parents would spend almost the whole year in Spain, and Aunt Nancy would come to Jersey to look after the boys, even at Christmas time. They used to buy Christmas presents, you know, months ahead, and wrap them up and put them in drawers. If he was in Jersey at Christmas by himself, they'd be in Spain and wish him happy Christmas and your presents from the drawers. And strange relationship. And um, yeah, for example, I, I talked my mother into having him round on Christmas Day, you know, because he's got no had no one else really. Just, just quite a strange setup. By the time they'd left school, Roderick and Mark believed that they'd been cast aside their entire childhood that got instilled in them, that they hadn't had a normal upbringing and it wasn't fair that the parents had treated them like this. The Newell brothers felt neglected and a growing resentment would eventually boil over with tragic results. Roderick rang up Mark and basically said, I've killed mum and dad. If you don't come round now, I'm going to kill myself. The wealthy Newell family arrived on the Channel Island of Jersey with their two young sons, Roderick and Mark, in 1967. While the boys hated being sent to Britain to boarding school, Nicholas and Elizabeth also felt let down when they failed to live up to their academic expectations. Nick had been to university, so had Elizabeth, St Andrews, very good university, and the least they would have expected was for their two boys for whom they paid a fortune in terms of fees at Radley School, would have gone to university. I think he must have been rather disappointed with them academically for a man and for parents who valued education, quite rightly, so very, very highly. Despite leaving school with few qualifications, younger brother Mark embarked on a career in high finance, working at one of Jersey's main international banks. Mark was a... An astute young man, there's no two ways of, uh, about that. He was very, very clever and very capable of making a lot of money and did make a large amounts of money. Meanwhile, Roderick decided on a career in the British Army. He went to Sandhurst, where he passed out as an officer and eventually joined the famous Royal Green Jacket Infantry Regiment. Dashing Roderick was trained by the army how to kill, how to avoid surveillance, and how to handle interrogation, all skills he would later utilize. Despite being in the army, Roderick enjoyed challenging authority. He regularly smoked cannabis at his barracks, high risk behavior. Had he been caught, he would have been court martialed and probably discharged. Roderick was an arrogant, young man to me he was i didn't take to roderick at all while roderick lived in army barracks in the uk mark lived on jersey in his own flat while their parents were living life to the full at their hilltop house but they were spending at a rate that couldn't be sustained and some of their investment decisions had been disastrous but they weren't concerned by heavy financial losses in jersey they lived a life of luxury while in Spain, they parted with friends whenever they could. The philosophy of Elizabeth and Nicholas Newell, the parents, was that life was to be enjoyed, was to be lived, it was for now. It wasn't to put it aside, it was to live in the present. So they, in terms of lifestyle, I think um, they were rather indulgent of themselves. The Newell brothers' career choices could not have been more diverse. Their personalities reflected how different they were. Mark was the very discreet, thinking, reflective, almost Machiavellian one, much more introverted, shy. Mark came over as asexual, which very few people are, whereas Rod was very much a ladies' man, a good-looking guy. He was handsome and dashing in this blue blazer with his blonde hair, and um, he attracted the girls, whereas Mark did not. 
Mark Newell's banking career took precedence over everything. He soon landed a lucrative new role and left Jersey for London. He's a bright lad, very sharp, so he was good at the markets. And he loved, he was a bit of a workaholic, he loved um, getting in early, leaving late. And because he lived by himself, he used to go home and just bought a nice Japanese sports car at the time. And then um, he would just have takeaways and just watch films. Unlike his brother, Roderick was not good with money and struggled to make ends meet in the army. One summer, while on leave, he returned to Jersey to ask his mother for help, paying his officer's mess bill. Elizabeth wanted to teach Roderick a lesson so that he too could be financially stable like Mark. She refused to bail him out. Full of pent-up anger and rage, Roderick snapped and punched his mother. To punch your mother, that's awfulness enough. So it doesn't just come out of the blue. Anyone who could do such a thing, to even inflict physical violence, with even of a slap, is not a normal person. Elizabeth forgave Roderick for the attack, but Mark heard about it and was shocked. Mark was a bit scared of him. Uh, they had a few, few run-ins, so it wasn't a close family by any means. Roderick was a bit of a hothead, a bit of a Jack the Lad. He certainly had a temper. He flew off the handle very easily. There are definitely boundaries being crossed there in the striking of his mother. That's, uh, you, you might expect a, a younger child to hit their parents and uh, learn very quickly that you don't do that. But as a, a, an adult to do that, that's quite a, a shocking thing to do. And once it's done, why shouldn't it happen again? By the mid-1980s, Roderick's simmering anger towards his parents was compounded by them spending their savings on a lavish lifestyle. I mean, there was probably some um, envy. Roderick and Mark were trying to set themselves up independently as, as uh, young men. But their parents were drifting through uh, in a rather pleasant life of drinks parties and going off to Spain. And um, it, it seemed like the life of Riley, probably compared to, to them. They hadn't had to work for things, perhaps the way that their sons perceived they had to work for and everything they wanted. With money draining away fast, Nicholas and Elizabeth needed to release some cash. The family home where Mark and Roderick grew up was sold. The Newells wanted to raise some cash. The main asset was the house at Crow's Nest, a beautiful home, and they bought much, much more modest premises in uh, close to l'Atlantique, a rather unattractive bungalow. Selling the family home was a huge disappointment to Roderick and Mark. Not only were they fond of their childhood home, once again, they saw their inheritance draining away. And there was worse to come. The majority of Nicholas and Elizabeth's wealth was invested in the Lloyds of London insurance market. In early 1986, Mark advised his parents to withdraw their money. As he predicted a downturn, they ignored him. But he was right. On Monday, the 5th of October, 1987, Mark Newell walked into his London office to discover that the Lloyd's insurance market had crashed. After digging deeper, he found out his parents faced a lifetime of paying annual fees to Lloyd's. The fees would amount to hundreds of thousands of pounds and would probably consume every penny of Nicholas and Elizabeth's assets, roughly a million pounds. The debt would only be cancelled upon Nicholas and Elizabeth's deaths. When he broke the news to his older brother, it was the beginning of Roderick Newell's countdown to murder. Roderick Newell had made up his mind. He could no longer live with the thought of his parents eating away at his inheritance. He convinced his younger brother Mark to join him at the family home for a surprise celebration at the end of the week. On Friday the 9th of October 1987, 
Mark and Roderick unexpectedly both flew back to Jersey to arrange an early 48th birthday party for their mother, Elizabeth. Holed up at Mark's house, Roderick's mind was made up. His parents had to die. But Mark knew nothing of his brother's plans. I don't think there were any clues at all as to the awfulness that was going to befall the Newell family. A seed is planted many, many years before. You think about it, you fantasize about it, you act it out in your mind. Elizabeth Newell booked a table for the following evening at the Seacrest Hotel on the southwest tip of the island. The next morning at 11 a.m., Roderick drove a hired red van to a builder's merchant in St. Helier, the capital of Jersey. He paid 103 pounds and 42 pence in cash for two spades, two tarpaulins, two torches and batteries, a pickaxe, heavy duty plastic sacks, a saw, rope, and a can of upholstery cleaner. Roderick now had the tools he needed to murder his parents and dispose of their bodies. Back at their tiny bungalow, Elizabeth Newell had a clear out of the boys' old possessions to make more space. These included a nunchuck, used by Roderick as a boy to practice martial arts. Early evening, and while Nicholas was getting ready for the family dinner, he suddenly remembered they had double booked. He'd arranged dinner with a friend who shared Elizabeth's birthday. So at 7 p.m., Nicholas and Elizabeth left for a quick drink with their friends, leaving a bottle of champagne for their sons. Mark Newell had volunteered not to drink that night, but couldn't start his own car. So, just before 8 p.m., he left his house, La Falaise, to drive his brother in the red van to their parents' bungalow. The murder kit, bought by Roderick Newell earlier that day, was in the back of the van. No one knows if Mark knew it was there. The boys arrived at the bungalow at 8.04 p.m. They were used to being abandoned as children, and this evening their parents again were nowhere to be seen. But Nicholas and Elizabeth soon came through the door and Nicholas went straight for the champagne. For Elizabeth, it seemed the perfect start to her birthday party. The Newell family left for the restaurant at 9.15 p.m. The family arrived at the Seacrest Hotel and sat down to their last meal together at 9.30 p.m. Throughout the meal, Mark drank cola and water but the rest of the family downed two bottles of champagne and three bottles of wine and dined on lobster and other seafood. Nicholas and Elizabeth were thrilled to have the family together again. The waiters would later say it looked like a family who were having a fantastic time. The bill was taken care of by Mark Newell. At midnight, the Newells returned home. Feeling tired, Mark Newell left almost immediately and travelled back to his house in the red van. When Elizabeth also called it a night, Nicholas and his son opened a bottle of Dad's favourite scotch. Before long, Nicholas questioned Roderick about where his life in the army was leading. With the alcohol doing more of the talking, Roderick Newell told his father that he wanted to leave the army. His disapproving father couldn't believe that his son, who hadn't made it to university, now wanted to ditch his career. A drunken row started, with Elizabeth listening at the door. As Roderick Newell's malice and bitterness for his father reared its ugly head, for the first time in his life, he faced up to him, accusing him of neglect. Appalled by the aggressive tirade, Nicholas ordered his son to leave. He refused, and Nicholas pushed him to the floor, hitting his head on the table as he fell. Nicholas prepared himself for a fight. The game had changed. Roderick put aside thoughts of the murder kit he'd bought that morning and the execution he'd carefully planned. 
Instead, incandescent with rage, Roderick grabbed the first weapon he could lay his hands on, the nunchuck from the box his mother had packed, and went for his father. Roderick attacked him, savagely beating him over the head. Elizabeth saw everything. As Nicholas's lifeless body lay on his living room floor, Roderick went after his mother. As she backed into her bedroom, he struck her over the head. She too was bludgeoned to death by the former army officer, receiving multiple lacerations. In total, she received seven head wounds ranging from 1.5 to 5.5 centimetres long. Nicholas Newell bore two lacerations at the front of the head and six at the back. They measured between three and eight centimetres long. Blood was sprayed around the bungalow. For both Elizabeth and Nicholas, death would have come quickly. Roderick Newell had planned it like this. He'd lost his temper and now he panicked. There was nowhere to turn other than to his brother Mark. Would he help or would he turn him in? Just a split-second decision that affected the rest of his life. Nicholas and Elizabeth Newell were about to lose what money they had left when their investment bank cr 87. Their sons who'd grown up believing their parents had neglected them now saw their inheritance draining away. Roderick Newell had decided enough was enough. If his parents were dead, he would still inherit their money. So Roderick Newell beat them both to death with a deadly martial arts weapon, a nunchuck. What happened next would lead to a five-year-long murder hunt that would captivate the nation. Though he counted on killing his parents with military precision and planning, after a drunken row, he'd hit out with the nearest weapon he could find. So to stick to his original plan and make it appear that his sailing mad parents had cast off into the night and simply disappeared, he needed help. Roderick called his brother, who was asleep back at his house. Roderick rang up Mark and basically said, I've killed mum and dad. If you don't come round now, I'm going to kill myself. And it was at that moment at which Mark had a key choice to make. Either he was going to shop his brother, call the police and denounce him with all the consequences that would ensue from that, or he was going to help him. And I don't know if he had time to, it was probably just a split second decision that affected the rest of his life. And he said, I'm on my way, I'm going to come and help you. Mark sped to the bungalow, and the brothers started their clear-up operation. First, they wrapped their parents' bodies, still warm, in tarpaulins. The bodies were very well preserved. They'd wrapped them up that tight. The brothers carried the corpses out to their hired red van. and drove to the north of the island to a wood behind the childhood home that their parents had sold to release funds. They lit a bonfire to destroy some of the evidence, then stood and watched as their parents' clothes and possessions went up in flames. And then the bonfire was remains of what later turned out to be Nicholas's spectacles and part of his pipe that he smoked. The brothers dug a large trench here in this glade and rolled the tightly wrapped bodies inside. Roderick used his army experience of searching for bodies and weapons in Northern Ireland to select the location of the grave. He dumped his parents' bodies over the side with his brother at night on a point where his military training told him, line of trees, cross the valley, bury them on the other side, just like he would have done if he'd been in the military or was looking for a, for a hide of, of weapons in Northern Ireland. Once the graves had been filled in, the brothers drove back to the bungalow and spent the night cleaning the blood from the walls and the floors. 
The last thing they did was turn up the heating to dry out the damp carpets. It was a scene that had been dried out or was attempted to be dried out. I mean, they actually ran the heating system down. There was virtually no oil left. I stood in that bungalow and we had no idea it was a scene of crime. The next day, the brothers flew out of Jersey. Mark back to his flat in London, Roderick back to his barracks. When friends of Nicholas and Elizabeth noticed them missing, they called the police. They tracked down the brothers and asked them to return to Jersey to help with their inquiries. Detective Graham Nimmo was the first to interview them at the family home. I just chose to speak to Mark first, and I asked Roderick to leave the room, which he did. Then I started to interview Mark, and he was... He's a very clever boy, Mark. He was... appeared normal. Um, but within a minute of me speaking to him, Roderick came barging in to the lounge and said, what's going on, what's going on, I want to be here. And I said, no, you're not going to be here, please go out. And he did that on two occasions. He came in and he was very, very agitated. Their stories tallied that the brothers spent the night at Mark's house before returning to their parents for breakfast and lunch the next day. Their statements then said they both flew out of the island that Sunday afternoon. But further analysis revealed inconsistencies. Dozens and dozens of points that came out that where they had completely different stories to tell. They thought they'd got the stories right, but they weren't expecting some of the questions. Where'd you sleep? Oh, I slept down, I slept downstairs on the on the cushions on the settee and Mark was upstairs. And when you interviewed Mark, it was the other way around. <laughs> but conflicting statements by themselves were not enough to prove a double murder had taken place. Jersey police treated the inquiry as one of missing persons. We organised a huge search of the island. I mean, it was news every night on the television. And we searched the coastline, obviously looking for bodies or any sign of the missing persons, but obviously found none. Everybody in the island knew the case. Everybody had a theory about it, from the postman to the dustman to the lady in the corner shop. Everybody wanted to know what had happened to Mr and Mrs Newell after a dinner party where their children could not explain why they'd gone missing. The disappearance of the Newells remained a complete mystery for four weeks until a Home Office scientist was called in to examine the bungalow. He ripped up the carpets and found minute traces of blood. But eventually we got the um, Home Office in, involved and they came in and it was just a massive scene of crime. Um, I know it sounds like we never found anything, um, but uh, the, the spots of blood were minute that they found and not visible to the naked eye. Finally, the police had proof. They had a double murder on their hands and they had two suspects. Roderick and Mark were shown pictures of what the police had found. And we went through the photographs with them. And interestingly, there wasn't a flicker of, oh, I, I was thinking they would say, oh, does that mean my parents are dead? Um, but no, no, there was nothing of that. They just looked at them and made absolutely no comment whatsoever. The Jersey detectives were almost certain that Nicholas and Elizabeth had been murdered in their own home. But where were their bodies? The police suspected the Newell brothers and felt they had a strong enough case. I personally thought we had enough to charge them, but uh, we had something like 60-something points where they differed in their stories. And it was a real blow to the inquiry. At that point, we came to a dead end. It was just, uh, we had a major incident running and it had run for a long, long time and we'd just got to the end of it and there was nothing else we could do. The case went cold. 
It looked like the Newell brothers had committed the perfect crime. They went their separate ways and picked up their lives. The people of Jersey soon forgot about the disappearance of Nicholas and Elizabeth Newell. Then in January 1991, over three years after the murders, Roderick and Mark Newell came back to Jersey. With their parents' bodies still missing, they came to have them declared dead. So with Nicholas and Elizabeth's debts wiped clean, the Newell brothers could at last claim their inheritance. They inherited the money, yeah. In the will, they were the sole beneficiaries. The brothers inherited just under one million pounds. With his newfound wealth, Roderick left the army and bought himself an ocean-going yacht called the Austral Soma. He sailed around the southern Atlantic, finally arriving in Brazil in early 1992. He met this woman, Helena Pedo, and lived with her for six months. On the other side of the Atlantic, Mark continued to excel at banking. He now had homes in London and Paris, always travelling first class. Nearly five years after Roderick killed his parents and Mark helped cover it up, the murder inquiry on Jersey had completely wound down. They seemed to have got away with it. And if only Roderick had not opened up his mouth, he would have got away with it and he w it would have been the perfect murder and the mystery would never have been resolved. Then in July 1992, Roderick sailed back to the UK to visit his much-loved aunt, his dead mother's sister, Nancy Clark. Racked with guilt, he let slip over dinner that he knew how his parents had died. He had made some sort of cryptic remark which implied that she would never understand what had happened. He told her he was going to Scotland to see his uncle Stephen. In a state of shock, she called the police. They called Stephen Newell. He agreed to take part in a surveillance operation. Roderick met his father's twin brother at this hotel. This is a man who was wrestling with his conscience over a very long period of time, and who was preparing himself to try and make some sort of peace with the family that he loved. People find it hard to live with guilt and shame inside them. It's a very corrosive emotion. People want to uh, unburden themselves by disclosing to somebody what they've done when they've done something very bad. The Jersey detectives arranged with Scottish police to bug the conversation. Went in, not knowing that he was surrounded by police, that there was a room only two doors down, full of surveillance equipment, full of surveillance officers. And we listened to the conversation. And it went on for ages and ages. I had put these people to a lot of expense and the conversation didn't turn to murder. Go on, say it, say it. But he didn't. The moment came when Stephen said to Roderick, I had a strange call from your aunt that you had said something to her. What was that all about, or words to that effect? And that triggered him changing from talking about what he'd been doing for the last few years to why he was there. And he started talking. And it did get to the point where he disclosed that the bodies were buried. We knew then that we were listening to the murderer. Roderick may have confessed to his uncle, but the Jersey police didn't have the jurisdiction in Scotland to arrest him, so they decided to follow him back to London. He left the hotel just after 7pm with unmarked police cars tailing him. He started doing some, what we call in the trade, dry cleaning, which is speeding up and slowing down. And every time he speeded up, he went up to 100 miles an hour in this GTI. Um, five cars behind him on the motorway kept up with him. Halfway back to London, Roderick saw he was being followed, but the army had taught him well. So he pulled off and did a couple of 
dry cleaning moves which he was taught in the military and eventually gave him the slip. He caught a ferry to France where he boarded his yacht and set sail for the Med. The police had let their chief murder suspect slip through their fingers. I mean, we tried everything to find him. We used all sorts of methods, which included, um, you know, hiring private yacht tracing agencies. We used surveillance from the air. We used nimrods. We used everything. Roderick Newell was on the run for over a week. His yacht was finally spotted in Gibraltar. And when Roderick put to sea again, the police called the Royal Navy. HMS Argonaut was in Gibraltar and sailed within hours. After a two-day pursuit on the high seas, they caught up with him, 150 miles southwest of Gibraltar. He was tricked to come aboard HMS Argonaut, and on the 6th of August, 1992, Roderick Newell was arrested. Almost simultaneously, French police arrested Mark Newell at his flat in Paris. Sitting propped up on a windowsill, they discovered a receipt. It was the bill for their parents' last supper at the Seacrest Hotel. The once angelic brothers were now in custody. But to convict them, the police would still have to find their parents' bodies. Feeling we need to walk over there. We went over there and um, looked down a hole. And there was a foot. It looked like the perfect upbringing. Two privately educated sons who'd built careers in the army and finance, but they detested their parents. They hated them for the way that they'd been brought up. And when they saw their inheritance being frittered away, one of them had enough. Roderick Newell battered his parents to death and brother Mark helped him bury their bodies. The disappearance of Nicholas and Elizabeth Newell remained a mystery for over five years. But Roderick's guilt eventually got the better of him. This is a man who was wrestling with his conscience over a very long period of time. With the help of the Home Office, Interpol, and even the Royal Navy, Roderick Newell was arrested in Gibraltar in August 1992. But Roderick's extradition from Gibraltar hung in the balance for months. The secret taped recording of his confession was deemed inadmissible by the Gibraltar courts. The police had to find more evidence. They started with his boat. Back to Gibraltar, it was full of little bits of evidence. The book, particularly, they had on board where we discovered the name of a lady in, in uh, South America, Miss Pedro, Helena Pedro. Detectives flew to Brazil and interviewed Roderick's former girlfriend. She gave us a long statement saying that he'd confessed to murder. And we had the statement and we used it, to great effect. Finally, Roderick could be extradited to stand trial in Jersey with his brother, Mark. On the flight from Gibraltar, he was presented with a map to show where he'd buried the bodies. He got a pen. Not got a pen, but it was a big pen. And he, he sort of rolled it in his fingers and put it down on a map of Jersey. And we're left with a, a spot on the map where he recalled the bodies had been buried. And... Then he looked so dark of despair, you know, he knew he was finished. Because from that moment on, we were in possession of what we needed, which was the bodies. On their arrival back in Jersey, police immediately took Roderick to the site he'd pinpointed. And we started that night with him, took him down there. And he said, I need to run. I need to run it, because he said, I ran it on the night. You know, I'm not thinking, um, do we want him running up the hill? Because we went to the bottom of the valley, and I said to the firearms officer, are you happy to run it with him? Uh, he was handcuffed to him, and he said, yeah, I'll do that. And I, I, I'm watching him run up the hill in the dark, and he comes to a point where he's, he's worked out in his own mind, I know how far this is. He ran up the hill, and he said, it's over there, somewhere over there. 
Then he started mucking us about by pointing to different places. He knew exactly where he was. Despite Roderick's imprecision, the police began their search for the bodies. We dug for three days. Very stressful. 60 paparazzi camped on top of a dig and no bodies. Even my own boss was saying, you better be right. This is becoming embarrassing. And suddenly there's this movement of tentage. And I was down at the command post. And I said, I have a feeling we need to walk over there. And we went over there and um, looked down a hole. And there was a foot. Nicholas and Elizabeth Newell were lying head to toe in their grave, tightly wrapped in tarpaulins. Nicholas still dressed in his dinner jacket and Elizabeth in her night. The bodies were removed for post-mortem examination. Roderick confessed to the murders, stating he'd killed his parents in a fit of rage. Though the police were convinced the killings were premeditated, Roderick's confession was enough to convict him. After a six-year murder hunt, Roderick Newell was found guilty of killing his parents. Mark was convicted of assisting the crime and conspiracy to conceal it. On the 8th of August, 1994, Roderick Newell began a double life sentence. Mark received eight years. To com commit that act is, is beyond comprehension. But the unanswered question for me was, would be, Mark, why did you help your brother? Why didn't you take a different route? And only he knows that. While Roderick Newell has always claimed the murders were not premeditated, and Mark Newell has always denied any involvement in them, some issues remain unclear. First, Fina Barbitone, a powerful sedative was found in Nicholas Newell's liver and stomach at his post-mortem. Had he been drugged before being murdered, or was he self-medicating? Next, the pathologist who carried out the post-mortem on Nicholas Newell's body stated that the six lacerations on the back of his head could not have been caused by the nunchuck and were more likely to have been caused by a pickaxe. If that is so, was it the pickaxe Roderick Newell bought from the St. Helier ironmongers and loaded into the hired red van? And if the pickaxe was the murder weapon, at what point was it unloaded from the van? Could it have been on the night of the murder in the moments before Nicholas and Elizabeth came back from their friends? If it was, then did Mark Newell know about it? Much speculation, few facts. Only the brothers know the answers, and they have told their story. I was emotionally involved. I was distressed at the end of it. I was very distressed after we'd found the bodies. It didn't do me any good. It was obvious that something of this magnitude had affected me. Tremendous admiration for some of the police officers who were living with the case and finding it very difficult to resolve it because until you found those bodies, you had nothing. And next week's investigation takes us to Blackpool and the death of Nurse Jane. We scrutinise that countdown to murder next Thursday at 9 here on Channel 5.